what is visual analytics. So I'll give you a um, quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. First, I'm going to introduce the problem. So what, what is the problem that visual analytics is addressing? And then try to sort of explain with a, a simple example how visual analytics, visual analytics may offer a solution. Um, then I'll actually say what visual analytics is. So try to give a definition of it only once I've given an example. And then I'll take you through two more examples. Uh, one is Advises, which was an e-science project in which I was a co-investigator. Um, and COCO, which is a project um, that a colleague of mine and also an associate member of the Decision Cognitive Sciences Group um, um, has, has been involved in. These are not necessarily the most sophisticated examples, but I think um, they are um, relatively easy to understand and simple enough to actually sort of get across the, the, the main principle of what visual analytics is. Um, then I'll go through some conclusions and tell you a little bit about what we're doing in DCS in relation to visual analytics and perhaps other things as well if you're interested. Okay, so, so the problem... Um, so the problem is um, been described in various ways but um, data gathering um, used to be um, one of the, you know, the most expensive and time-consuming parts of, of doing research. Um, uh, but um, that data, the gathering of data has become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And as a result, uh, more and more data is being gathered. Um, this is sometimes called the data deluge, um, that there's so much data that um, it's almost impossible to actually to analyze all of it and try to make sense of it. Um, so to combat that, um, a lot of people have rightly uh, focused on um, building and designing automated um, processing and analysis tools, algorithms, etc. cetera. So um, algorithms in data mining, text mining, um, um, support for multi-criteria decision analysis, for example, optimization algorithms, etc., um, and also naturalistic decision analysis, just like Bayesian models, which I understand was a, a topic um, in this series uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and um, and they will they certainly um, um, contribute to this our ability to um, um, deal with the huge amounts of data um, that are being currently being collected. Um, in, in various ways. Um, however, um, these, these methods also have a number of drawbacks. Um, so I, I've just, just sort of um, outlined one here, but, but there, are, there are quite a few, few more, and I'll just briefly mention a few. Uh, I think one of the most um, important ones, perhaps, is that fully automated search, filter, and analysis tools work reliably only for well-defined and well-understood problems. So the designer of these tools, first of all, has to have a good idea of the nature of the problem and the possible uh, nature of the, of the results and the, in, in the outcomes in order to actually design these, these algorithms. Um, and a lot of, um, in perhaps arguably the most interesting problems, are um, very complex and um, uh, not necessarily very well defined and, and sort of fuzzy. And the, the whole idea is that the analysis process will actually give more definition to it um, by building up a gradual understanding of the problem. Um, there are the other problems um, as well, um, which, which um, just to mention one is the problem of accountability. So if you have a, um, a decision analysis um, algorithm that comes up with some sort of solution that says, right, this is the best decision, um, then say, well, who, well, if it turns out not to be the best decision, then who's accountable? Is it the decision maker or is it the fault of the algorithm? Okay, so there are, there are a number of problems um, associated with um, just leaving it up to these automated processes. Um, and therefore, um, it's... Um, worthwhile trying to think about how the um, decision maker or the analyst can actually get involved 
in the process of analyzing or processing uh, these, these um, amounts of data. Can, ev can everybody still see it? Because it's with the sun on it, it's quite vague. Yeah, you're, it's all right? Yeah, not too fuzzy? Right, okay. Right, so just an example that I think um, will um, be close to home for, for just about any, everybody is uh, web information retrieval. So search engines on the web. Um, you know, everybody's using Google, whatever search engine. Um, and these essentially are um, information retrieval algorithms being applied to, to the World Wide Web. And the World Wide Web is a huge amount, a huge um, um, collection of information, data, um, which is very ill-structured um, in lots of different formats. And, and people perform these searches um, for lots of different purposes and, and um, had objectives. Okay, so uh, it's very hard to come up with, with an algorithm that will just simply um, suit everybody. Um, so everybody's familiar with, um, with the, the more common ones, such as Google. Um, and the way these, these um, algorithms, uh, these uh, processing methods are, are um, evaluated is... Um, traditionally an information retrieval by um, two parameters. One is uh, recall, and recall is essentially is the, um, the practice. I'm not an expert in information retrieval, so I hope you don't mind if I just read it from the, from the screen. The fraction of the documents that are relevant to the query that are successfully retrieved. Okay, so if you have um, X um, number of documents that are relevant to your query, then it's the proportion of X that is being retrieved that um, denotes the, the recall ability to recall um, of that algorithm. Precision is the fraction of the documents retrieved that are relevant to the user's information need. So um, if, you, if the algorithm retrieves an X number of documents, how many of those documents are actually relevant to the query? Okay, and the problem is that uh, most of the time um, I think, I'm right in generalizing it, um, that there is a trade-off between um, recall and precision. Um, so um, in order to increase recall, you can retrieve more documents, but that usually means that you will have less precision. And in order to increase the precision, um, you um, focus or you restrict the number of documents being retrieved, which would therefore increase, might increase recall some extent um, but uh, and the designer of these algorithms can sort of make some sort of judgment and say well what what's a good balance between recall and, and precision and they can use optimization algorithm and say okay well um, you know we've, there's some way we can optimize this trade-off but the problem is that it's not a fixed trade-off the, the trade-off depends very much on the objective that the person have for actually searching the web so um, if if it's very imp important that um, a particular document is being found, then recall is becomes the, the, the dominant um, 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 uh, parameter for for uh, for, um, for evaluating the performance of the of the algorithm. Um, but if you don't want sort of too many um, too many different um, irrelevant um, documents and it's not that important that you get every single relevant uh, document then then precision is more important um, so so it depends on the individual and their objectives and their, the type of query etc where the balance between um, recall and precision should be there's there's another um, problem associated with search engine is um, relevance so so how how do you actually measure which documents are the most relevant to a particular query. And, and uh, Google is, is famous um, for actually um, um, introducing this sort of um, ranking system um, of, um, of documents being retrieved in, um, for, for a particular query um, that takes into account the document neighborhood and, and things like that. Um, but more and more 
it has evolved into um, a, a, a means of making money. So, um, so businesses try to try to be at the top of the of the ranking of the pages um, being being returned. Um, so, and those may not necessarily be the most relevant uh, documents to your to your query. Um, so there are there are uh, conflicting um, sort of interests here for both the, the search engine provi provider and the, and and the, the people um, making use of them. Okay, so wouldn't it be nice if we have some way of sort of individualizing, personalizing this sort of trade-off between um, recall and and precision, and also at the same time sort of get rid of this um, idea of uh, relevance and ranking or um, at least uh, less so. So this is a, um, is, that, is that clear? It's not very clear, is it? Okay, so um, it is a bit higher definition here on the screen than, than it is there now. Okay, so this, this is called a, a galaxy representation of a, um, of how um, a, pages that are retrieved in response to a, to a query can be um, represented. Um, and um, so this is an example by Wong um, in 2008. So you um, see that each of these uh, white dots is a, a page that is retrieved. And the query, the query here, by the way, is jobs. Okay, so you can see that there are sort of a number of they, they, they also apply a clustering um, algorithm and if you can see that there are a number of cl clusters here software development software developer academic positions business um, sales down here etc but you can also see that there is a thing here about apple iphones and steve okay so jobs um they might be thinking of this, so that you know the, the, the user might be looking for a job, or they might want to know or find out something about Steve Jobs of Apple. Okay, so the thing is with this, um, the um, the precision um, is at this, this point not that important. So because um, people have an overview of all the different results. Um, at that point, it's perhaps more important to increase the recall of an algorithm because the pre precision can then gradually be increased by people actually interacting. So people can um, click on these clusters and then these clusters will expand and then people get a, a more detailed view of each of these clusters and then lose the view of all the things that are not, maybe not so relevant to their, to their uh, query. Um, so, someone who is looking for a job will click in here and someone who wants to find out about something about Steve Jobs, I will click there. Okay, so you get, people can personalize the sort of the trade-off between um, recall and precision. And also, you, there's no need for a ranking here because you can actually see all the different um, pages that are being, being retrieved. Okay, um, there is some lots of detail um, in this, and, and the, um, there are some issues with the clustering algorithm, etc. Okay, we can sort of see how, how this might provide a, a, a better solution um, compared to the sort of more traditional um, ways of rep um, presenting um, search uh, results, web search results. Okay, so this is just a, sort of a quick um, example that you're probably all familiar with. Uh, related to um, to this idea of actually um, being able to personalize and manipulate the results um, of uh, some automatic filtering or search or, or processing algorithm. Okay, so now now to come back to the question, what what is visual analytics? Um, there are a number of um, definitions, and and there is there's a recently a, a book. Um, published by uh, a group of uh, very prominent members of the visual analytics community, uh, which is uh, Kaim et al, uh, 2010, uh, published by the Eurographic Society. And they define visual analytics as 
uh, visual analytics combines automated analysis techniques with interactive visualizations for an effective understanding, reasoning, decision making on the basis of very large and complex data sets. Okay, now, I, th I more or less agree with that, but I think that there are some problems here, apart from the, um, the poor grammar, uh, which, which is actually not m a mistake that I made. Um, but uh, mainly my issue is that um, the question is, what is visualization? Okay, and, and they um, seem to think that visualization is the graphic representation of data or information. Okay, whereas um, commonly visualization is defined as being something that the analyst or the decision maker does. Um, it's the process of understanding, um, creating a mental picture of um, the structure in data or, or um, so it's, it's, a, it's a mental um, process that is um, carried out um, in the, in the, uh, by the, uh, the analyst or the decision maker. Maker. So therefore, I would personally um, put forward uh, the slightly more accurate um, definition of visual analytics, which is the activity of guidance and observation by a human analyst of automated data processing analysis tools and algorithms through interactive graphical representations for, and then go back here, um, effective understanding, reasoning, and decision-making on the basis of very large and complex um, data sets. Okay, so I think that that's just more accurate. Um, so essentially the goal of visual analytics is to make our way of processing data and information transparent for an analytic discourse. And I think that that's, that's the, so the, the key term here is an analytic discourse, um, which um, solves the problem of um, so having an algorithm that's a, sort of more or less a, a one-size-fits-all uh, matter, um, or um, the, the problem of accountability. Um, so, how far am I now? Okay. Okay. So, just a couple of examples. So, the first one is advisors. Um, and this was a project, um, an e-science, uh, EPSSC e-science project, which ran between 2006 and 2009. Um, the, um, the investigators are listed down here. Um, and the objectives of this project were to analyze users' research methods and questions using sublanguage, and to, um, um, and as a result, we came up with a research question-driven workflow for data analysis. Okay, so everything starts with a question. Okay, and that question may be maintained throughout the analytical process or it may sort of evolve and, and become, become more and more sophisticated, but that, that's, the, that's the whole point. Okay, to develop a prototype, interact a graphical representation or data analysis tool driven by research questions. So based on the basis, say, okay, well, when we got that, those research questions, then we provide a tool in which um, people can interact with graphical representations of the data in order to answer uh, these questions. To evaluate the prototype with research in the medical e-science e community, and then to develop a user-centered requirement analysis and design method for e-science. Um, that, that's not really that relevant at the moment. Um, that was sort of an extension. But the vision, I think, is very important because it's sort of a vision, not just for advisors, but it's a vision for visual analytics. And that's the idea that research questions are the science interface, okay? So everything starts with a question, okay? If you can express the question um, and then on the basis of that question, build some sort of graphical representation that you can interact with then everything sort of follows from there. And I'll, I'll explain why, why I think that that might work. Um, and also interactive representations allows you to see the effect of your question and a 
allows you to interpret the result in context. So it also not just gives you an answer, but it also makes you understand why that is a good answer and how that answer came about. Okay, so the, the domain we were working in was epidemiology. Um, and essentially, sort of, well, a small part of that was understanding childhood obesity. Um, and um, essentially, the, the objective in that is to do um, what, what the main, so the main activity in that is to do causal analysis from complex multivariate spatial temporal evidence. Um, so using multivariate statistical analysis with differences between cohorts over time between areas. So these are sort of geographical data or geographically linked uh, data. I'm not quite sure how you, how you call that. Okay. Um, but we found the, the traditional workflow in this was that although people started with a research question, they then said, okay, well, in order to answer that question, what kind of statistical analysis do I need to perform? Um, and then once they found um, some sort of um, um, evidence um, in favor or, or, or um, to confirm or disconfirm their hypotheses, then they would construct some sort of static representations in order then to convey those, um, those insights from the statistical analysis to a wider audience. Um, and um, we thought that the visual analytic, analytical workflow um, might um, uh, be an improvement. So the, the visual analytical workflow would be start with a research question, but then build an interactive representation on the basis of that research question, but also then link it to statistical information. The, um, the, the benefit of that, and the, the, the main difference uh, between the traditional workflow and the visual analytical workflow is this sort of feedback loop, is where you go from the statistical information back to defining or refining uh, your research question. Um, and that, that could happen at this point, but it could also happen at, at this point in, in the workflow. So I've got to put a little connection there. Okay, so, so this, is, this is what the prototype um, uh, looked like. Um, so um, in this, um, so the, the, uh, the, the user starts uh, with defining the research question in this term, in this, in this example, looking at the height and the body mass index of a, um, uh, a particular sample of the population, uh, which is, um, has some sort of ge geographical um, distribution, and then build maps um, with, those, um, with those data. Um, and then, um, so the, 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 the user can then uh, find uh, particular areas that might be of interest, um, but also interact with the statistical data here. So they, ha they have a, sort of a, a, a um, histogram showing the distribution of the, of the data and they can um, interactively um, restrict the, the range of the, of the um, variable um, uh, being, being looked at um, to focus on particular um, parts of the data, etc. So uh, this is all a bit static and it doesn't really sort of give you a good insight of how it actually works. So instead of this, I will show you a video, which I have to... Um, bring up on the screen, okay. So, okay, now the only problem with this video is that um, there's no um, nar narrator with this video, and it's all in text, but the text is actually presented too short to allow you to read all of it. Okay, um, so what I'll do is I'll just pause whenever the text appears, I'll pause it and I'll read the text and then I'll carry on with the, with the video. Okay, so. Okay, so advisors, I'll try to sort of narrate it as, as we go along. So, 
Okay, so um, this is the, the beginning you upload uh, a data file. So um, everything starts with a, with a data file to being uploaded. Um, and then the, um, so if I just pause it, and then the tool will use the, the very first sort of um, variable in the data file to create a map. Okay, and uh, you can see that there are, um, and you, but you can change the, the variables, variables actually being, being displayed. And you can also change the, the, um, the, the amount of detail in, in the map, which I will try to show. Okay, so our advisors has created a map using the first data column in the file, which in this case is height, so the height of, of each person in the sample. Uh, but we'll change the theme variable to uh, body mass index so people can then select the variable they're interested in. So, um, okay, so now the fact that you have now um, two variables, that's a bivariate map, um, so height will be unticked now. So now the, so every um, area in the map now represents the the average body mass index um, of the um, sample within within those particular areas. Okay. Um, right. So now we can um, once that's done, you can sort of play around uh, with. So you're interested in body body mass index, but um, you may, on the basis of looking at the distribution, you may uh, find that. Um, there, there are certain parts of the of the, uh, the sample that you want that you're more interested in. You want to get more detail of. Okay. So, so essentially, the research question here, and that's probably important to, to mention, is the um, the the uh, distribution of body mass index um, over a particular area. Um, so, so over. Um, um, or between areas, so that so the differences between areas are, are being examined essentially. <coughs> so, what we've done? Um, oh, sorry, it's still still being right. Should have rehearsed this a bit better. Um, okay, so the so the the menu now the the fresh it's called a threshold slider has been being um, activated and that means that the um, the range um, or in the distribution can be restricted um, manually to focus on a particular part of, of the dis of the distribution so Advisors automatically split your data into um, five even quantiles. So this is, this is a, apparently a sort of standard procedure in epidemiology where you um, select, um, um, try to, to um, split the file up into meaningful groups. Okay, and, and sometimes, that, well, most of the time, that's by using uh, quantiles. Uh, but sometimes, but that is not necessarily the case. So. It may be um, more informative to split the, um, the, the, the range up into more meaningful categories, uh, perhaps as, as a meaningful uh, body mass index categories. So for example, uh, being underweight, uh, normal weight, overweight or obese, uh, which is not necessarily com complies with, uh, with even uh, quantiles. Okay, so, so you can manually drag the, the boundaries for the quantiles. Um, okay, so the map also is uh, drawn uh, with the most, the highest level of detail, so the, the areas are the, the smallest. Now the problem with that is that um, the, um, the size of the, 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 the number of uh, individuals in the sample for, the, for for each particular area could be quite small. Okay, so that, that you run the risk then to, um, if you think that a particular area stands out from from other areas, 
that you base that sort of inference on actually a very small number of um, um, data points in your sample. Um, so it's possible to sort of aggregate the areas into uh, larger areas. Okay, you can actually see that the this is a box and whisker plot which shows the sample size and the variance um, of each of the areas in the map. Um, and in so you can see that the sample size uh, can be for certain areas can be very, very small, which is denoted by the very small boxes. So because there are too many small boxes, um, we, sw we switch to a, a higher, um, less detailed view of the data, which is a, a middle super output area. Um, okay, and then you can start um, um, interactively exploring the different areas. So by, by um, hovering the mouse over a particular area, you get um, more information about that particular area in terms of the means, the variance, um, etc. Okay, and also the um, in the box and whisker plots, those are displayed or highlighted in a different color. So, if you're inter uh, you're interested in changes over time, a lot of advisors let you play a series of maps, so you can actually sort of um, animate um, a number of maps um, of data taken at various different time points. So, um, so this would be. Um, it's not quite clear which, which years they were in, but there were four different time points and you can just, by clicking on the arrows, go back and forth and, and then see if there are any sort of really uh, major changes in, the, in the, uh, the nature of the map. You can also add um, point data. So these are, for example, um, fast food outlets um, and the distribution of fast food outlets um, in the, in the particular in the particular areas and that allows you then to see whether there's any sort of correspondence between um, areas with very high um, uh, levels of um, overweight children and, and obese children um, and the distribution of the fast food outlets. Okay, so this this is just an example of any 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 questions, any anything that's not uh, feel free to, to answer to ask any questions if there's anything that's not clear, just sort of stop me and I can explain that a bit more because I may be rushing through it a little bit, I, I realize. Okay, so, right, we go back to the presentation. Um, okay, so now, um, the second example um, is completely different. Um, and this is um, COCO, Control and Observation of circuit optimization, um, and um, and this particularly in, in sort of analog circuit um, design. Okay, and the reason I chose this is um, there are a number of reasons. Well, the first reason is that it's arguably the very first visual analytics application. Okay, so this dates from the early 1990s, um, and the, the second reason is that um, it was work that was done at Imperial College by uh, Robert Spence and um, some colleagues and um, um, he is an associate member of the uh, Decision and Cognitive Science Research Group at MDS um, and they, um, we have a, a close collaboration uh, with him as well. Okay, so the, the idea behind um, COCO was uh, to support the human guidance of automated design. Okay, so the automated design here is that you can have some sort of algorithm um, which takes all the different parameters, the different variables, the things that you can vary within your design and it can compute some value. And then it can um, say, okay, well, what, what's the, the configuration of different parameters that gives you the highest value or the, the, optim the optimized uh, value, okay? And the, the problem with that, with that is that it doesn't actually give you any sort of insight in how that uh, value comes about and what the relationship is between the different parameters. And if you would change something in either in the algorithm or add a parameter or something like that, what kind of difference that, that might make? 
So in order to demonstrate this, I've got another video I'd like to show you. This one fortunately is narrated, so I don't have to uh, narrate. We can just I can just sit back and let you watch this. Mind you, this this is oh is there is there sound? Oh, there's sound. Is that what it is? Most things are designed by human beings. This toy, for example. This car and this complex silicon chip. Design usually involves an exploratory activity in which parameters of the object are adjusted step by step. Parameters such as the thickness of this piece of wood, the slope of this windscreen, and the width of this piece of semiconductor on the chip. When the designer alters a parameter, a property of the object changes. The weight of the toy, the wind resistance of the car, and the power of the chip. With most objects that are designed, there are many parameters, each affecting many important properties. For example, the material of this toy affects its weight, its cost, its manufacturability, and its fire resistance. Now the designer wants to create the best toy the best car and the best silicon chip. But because the quality of design is a function of all these properties, the design of the best or optimum object involves repeatedly altering the parameters until sufficient quality is achieved. For a human designer, this is a very difficult task, especially when conflicting properties are involved. It's not possible to have the best of all worlds and the designer must find a compromise. This task isn't so difficult for a computer. The computer can automatically and rapidly adjust parameters until it senses that the design is optimum. But the computer has to be told by a human designer what is meant by quality, how to choose adjustable parameters, and what common sense limits apply to the design. So we bring the human and the computer together to exploit their different but complementary capabilities. The human first describes the object whose design has to be improved. Here, the designer of a hi-fi amplifier has sketched a design. But the predicted property is not quite satisfactory, so the designer defines the ideal performance. He can also draw upper and lower limits that should not be violated. By adjusting the height of these vertical bars, the designer can indicate the relative importance of different, perhaps conflicting, design requirements. Then the designer is advised by a mathematical expert about optimization. The computer, with its optimization ability, now attacks a problem under the designer's surveillance. To help this process, we show the circuit problem symbolically, with the size of this circle representing the inadequacy of the design. The computer is attempting to reduce it step by step, often taking 20 or more steps to achieve a better design represented by a smaller circle. But the quality of a design depends on many properties, each of which affects the performance. So we have a circle for each constituent property. For example, these lower circles show how hot the hi-fi gets, how poor the treble response is, and how much noise can be heard. Additional detail is always available. While watching how the quality of the product is being improved, the designer can also see how the parameters are being varied, because each parameter is represented by the height of a bar. And underneath each value bar is another bar indicating how sensitive the quality of the design is to that parameter. Of course, the designer would also welcome another friendly expert to warn him or her of any peculiarities and unexpected properties of a design, and generally to offer advice. This expert is, in fact, built into the system and attracts the designer's attention by activating one of these bulbs. When the designer responds, the advice is displayed. This display is called the cockpit. Like the combination of an aircraft pilot and an automatic pilot, our designer can observe the progress made by automatic design, but intervene when it's useful or necessary. The cockpit interface brings the benefits of optimization to designers in engineering 
who would otherwise not use it, thereby facilitating better and more reliable designs. The control and observation of circuit optimization, COCO for short, is based on the philosophy of blending together the different but complementary capabilities of the computer, the human designer, and knowledge elicited from experts. Right, okay, so... So the, the, amongst the many benefits of having this sort of um, um, graphical representation of the relationship between the, out, the, the, the performance parameter or the, the performance measure and the, and the different sort of parameters. Um, so if any sort of automated process, if you just give you the result and say, well, this is the best configuration of parameters because it's the lowest, it's the, um, the, the, um, the best sort of optimized um, um, overall um, quality um, value, then um, you, you would, might be able to miss um, or not get any insight into what the relationship between the different parameters is. So for example, while the algorithm is um, ticking away, so sort of doing, doing these sort of um, um, itera iterative s um, steps, um, you might notice that the uh, pr properties um, start, start to oscillate. So when, when a, a particular parameter is being varied, um, the uh, one particular property may increase in, in, in value, another decrease, and then the next step, it's the other way around, and you get this sort of, sort of oscillation. And that basically means that certain properties are related. Okay, um, and then you can, say, okay, well, how can I change my design or the requirements uh, that I put on this design? Um, or how can I add particular properties that would break that relationship um, if possible? Okay, so, so really getting that sort of insight um, can be very, very valuable. Um, okay, so conscious of the, of the time we've got, and I want to uh, give you a bit of time for questions as well. So... Um, conclusions. Okay, so there are there are a number of advantages. Um, sensitivity. Um, so um, and this sort of sort of linked to insight. But sensitivity is a concept where you say, okay, um, well if I if I had to um, change something in the setup of my algorithm, do I know um, what the nature of those changes? Um, should be in order to give me the, the maximum uh, benefit of those changes, okay? Um, and you, you wouldn't get that if you just get a number at the end of um, two hours of calculation or whatever. Okay, flexibility, it allows you to, uh, to personalize the, the parameters and the requirements that you set to your data processing or, or analysis. You gain um, insight into uh, relationships uh, between uh, various um, 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 parts of, of, your, of your data or your design. Um, and also allows you to collaborate because you can then communicate that insight and you can actually um, um, justify why a particular um, outcome um, is um, acceptable or um, or the best one uh, possible within uh, a number of um, um, constraints, and that and that then also gets gets uh, deals with the the problem of accountability. Now, obviously, there, are, despite you know, many advantages, there are also um, a number of issues that need to be resolved, and, and this is not an exhaustive list of the number of issues um, that need to be resolved. But these are the ones that we are concentrating on. So. This, this idea of analytical discourse. What, what is analytical discourse? How, how do people go about sort of um, matching evidence to the, the questions they have in order to, to find answers? Okay, so one thing that's, that's often been found is this idea of exploration, exploitation trade-offs. So when, when do people stop exploring new data and exploiting what they already know. Okay, essentially in, in decision making, it's the idea of, okay, well, will I make the decision on, on the basis of what I already know, 
or will I try to find out more about the problem in order to perhaps uh, be able to make a better decision? And that can, can explain a number of cognitive biases that people exhibit. So for example, um, the pre premature um, uh, commitment uh, bias is where people um, um, go for a particular solution or an answer or a decision uh, without really um, having um, sufficient evidence to support that conclusion or that answer. Or conf confirmation bias, where people s um, s simply uh, focus on evidence that is going to confirm their preconceived ideas rather than really sort of make a, make a decision or, or um, 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 come to a conclusion on the basis of, the, of what the evidence tells them. And then additionally, there are also analytical and worldview gaps. Um, so having a representation of the data, um, it could be that um, there is a particular, um, uh, something particularly salient in the representation that's, n that's not matched by any sort of structure or salience in the data set, okay? So how do, how do we make clear that um, what people see in the representation is also a feature of, of the data, a statistical feature of the data? In, in the advisors prototype, we took care of that by actually having the statistics and the representation together so people could go back and forth. Um, and finally, worldview gaps. So. Um, once something meaningful and interesting has been found um, in, in the data, how does that then relate to the real world? Um, how do people match um, um, from, from representations to, to what actually is going on in, in the real world? Okay, so these are the kinds of questions that we're trying to tackle. And then finally, I'd like to say a little bit about um, Decision Cognitive Science uh, Group um, and why we are um, in, a, in a good position to actually sort of tackle these, these kinds of questions. Um, the Decision Cognitive Sciences, uh, we include so decision science, we have people working in mul multiple criteria of decision analysis, naturalistic decision making and decision support, and also in the Cognitive Science Group, we're looking at behavioral decision analysis analytical discourse um, and sort of adaptive systems. So this idea that you, you have systems that can be personalized that don't restrict the user necessarily to one way um, or of, of um, trying to solve a problem, but, but that um, um, people can, can um, adapt to their own circumstances and, uh, and uh, requirements. Um, and that's, um, that's about it for me. So um, I'm happy to take um, questions. So thank you very much for um, listening, being patient. Um, happy to take questions. Here's some contact details. Um, and also I'd like to, if you have any sort of um, work with automated uh, processing or analysis algorithms, and you've got experience of um, trying to um, um, merge those with sort of human insight and, and human guidance, then I'd, I'd love to hear from you or if you have any other ideas or whatever. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay.